Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky tunes. Hello, welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm your host, Darren Bresnitz. Big shout out to the Eagles for going to the Super Bowl. And in honor of them today, we're having a Philadelphia food guest. We have Omar Tate and Sybil St. Odd Tate from Honeysuckle Provisions and Honeysuckle Projects. We've been following their story for quite a few years, and we're so excited that they're finally sitting down with us on the show. We talk about how they met, their shared history, how art and poetry drives what they do and what community means to them. And then we go into the archives as we have a live performance from Miwa La Lupa, who sat down with Greg years ago in the shipping containers, a multi-instrumentist from Buffalo, New York, and it's a really, really great performance. And on one final note, we're sending our love to Hannah and Connor and everyone over at Gemini. We loved your pastries. We can't wait to see what you do next. And if you have a chance, they're still serving them up through mid-February. So please go check them out, order something for Valentine's Day, and send your love and support. You will not be let down. They're some of the best baked goods in the biz. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hear Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. If you're facing the judge with a fistful of drugs, all accomplices fled from your sight. The responsible one feels the wrath, takes the brunt of it all with a false sense of pride. The papers all follow you from town to town. Your exes all forward the mail For 36 moons, little food on her plate She's an outlaw in the salty state If you're still up at dawn Feeling trashed like a pawn in a game All the animals play Light a candle to pray, light the bowl and relate to the wild ones, the witches and slaves. She fought for a freedom that doesn't exist. What's wrong with these people? She cried. 
Just four years ago And her case is dismissed We'll drive round the border of flight The shackles will fall to the ground Released from the spell for a while Her record was cleaned by the maid Don't punish a made up mistake. Only two things to choose either jail time or blues. The latter choice must make you stronger. Be it one state or more if you don't know the laws. Your sentence. Stretch on forever The bright side of torture Is stories for days The skeletons out of the closet The music is soothing Inspiring to boot The slow-moving sweet dissonance The shadows will fall to the ground Released from the spell for a while Her record was clean by the maid Sybil and Omar, welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down and chat with me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Our pleasure. Um, Wait, I book for you. Is it your pleasure too? I think it's everyone's <laughs> pleasure. My pleasure as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things I want to get to, but you know, as someone who was born and raised in Philadelphia, and you guys are coming to some Philly, let's hit the most important topic of the day how many points will the eagles beat the chiefs by um about a week from now what are we talking like (laughs) you know um i'm superstitious about these kinds of things man you're not gonna trap us you're not gonna trap us (laughs) no i'm gonna answer because i'm a recent convert to the eagles i was born and raised fan so um having been in philadelphia for a couple years now i've grown to really enjoy the other shade of green um so i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna say that they're gonna beat the chiefs by 14 okay yeah i feel pretty good about it um you know i feel like mahomes ankle is just not gonna hold out and uh (laughs) you know it's we're gonna they're gonna be greasing greasing the lampposts uh like they did this past weekend yeah Um, yeah they're still greased they're still greased (laughs) greased. um so you know one of the things i love about growing up and being from Philadelphia is that whether you're from there, you've lived there, you move there, you really feel the community and it extends to in the walls of the city. Whenever you meet someone from Philly, you just, there's an immediate connection. Um, What does that community mean to you? And having moved back a couple of years ago, how have you integrated yourself um, into the city? Mm. Want to go ahead? Well, yeah. I mean, for being, I guess, a quote unquote transplant, um, Mm -hmm. being newly adapted into the Philly scene, um, there really is nothing like it. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, you grow up and you hear a city of brotherly love and you hear all this like touristy kind of catchphrases and catchwords. Mm -hmm. But but, I don't know, having been 
in the city now for a few years, I can really say that this is definitely like a brotherly love kind of city. You know, it's mm-hmm. like a stranger feels almost like an annoying brother or annoying kid sister. Sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's different from like New York, right? Or in New York, it's yeah. kind of like everyone might be rude. They might be aggressive. They might be like hip and fashion-y. But Philly is just has like this general grittiness and this genuineness. Like mm-hmm. it, it might come off to someone as rude or aggressive, but if you're in Philly, you live in Philly, you grew up in Philly, you know that that's just how people are out here. And and it comes from a place of love. And it's so interesting in how we approach what we do and our offerings in the store um, because we we kind of opened up with this mentality of like, okay, well, these neighbors are going to, it's going to be like they're eating at our own home. And mm. for it to happen, we didn't really have to put too much effort into it besides make the space cute make the food good and just be very intentional about what we were doing. And it was just because we're in Philly, it just, it just made sense that every person that walks through that door feels like they're dining intimately with us. And it's is like fast cash, right? This is takeout food. We don't have seats. Sure, have sure. Space. This is a grocery cafe, but it, it still feels there's a warmth to it. There's a, a sincerity to it that I think that could really only exist in Philly, specifically in West Philly. We really mm-hmm. have part of the neighborhood here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I grew up here, right? So for yeah. me, it's a little, it's a little different, um, because like the thing that I love about our store, kind of like the, to double down on what Sybil was just saying, it is this kind of like beautiful hub. It's in West Philadelphia, and people come to it, and they flock to it, and it has this beautiful energy about it. But when I was growing up, there was nothing really like that, like mm-hmm. in different hoods that me and my friends or my brothers would hang out in. So like. To go to to go to a spot or go to a place with a vibe or whatever, you had to leave your neighborhood. You know, you had to go right. to town or you had to go to like, you know, um, like the Trocadero to go listen to music and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And all these different neighborhoods are, you know, not just West Philly, North Philly, West Philly, South Philly. All these different pockets within Philadelphia, outside of the scope of Center City, are all building their own situation and um, making it so that you can kind of diversify where things, where, where the happenings are happening at. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things about what we're doing here is that we're creating that vibe here in West Philly and having people yeah. travel to other parts of the city to come see us. And on top of all that, you know, we're on a strip of other historically Black-owned, you know, not historically, but Black-owned businesses that have been around sure. for a number of years. You know, um, Spirit Foods right next door to us. Um, Atia Ola, she's been in the, in the neighborhood for 30 years serving vegan food. Uh, 48th Street Grill is a Jamaican restaurant next door that's mm-hmm. been around for about 10 years. And we all talk amongst one another and seeing how, you know, business is kind of like moving in a different way. You know, people are coming to this block, coming to the street, coming to this neighborhood, as opposed to just making everything, you know, downtown, the epicenter of everything. Yeah. And, you know, the Philly food scene has grown so much in the last 10 or 20 years mm-hmm. to the point where I remember leaving – for college in 2000 and coming back a few years later and being like, oh, wow, Philly has really got a point of view, is really celebrating the people from here in a way that New York was different. New York was just a different um, a different beast in its way. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the two of you because it's always nice to have a couple on who work together and things like that. And I've read a little bit about your story, but how did you two meet? And then how did you two decide to not just – be together, but to work together. Cause that is a, that's a big jump. <laughs> well, so I, we met at work. So I think that was probably the foundation for it and why it seems it's to always seem a good like, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, every time I tell the story, I have to kind of note that it does kind of seem like, like a corny rom-com. Like it is very kind of love at first sight ish. Um, and we it. can't wait for a movie deal in a few years. Uh, Omar's gonna say he wants Idris Elba to play him. I, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's uh, appropriate. Um, but hey, shoot for the stars. Really? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I actually think I've been I've been thinking about this over the past week after I've said it. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm thinking I'm thinking Donald Glover might be. Oh, uh, that's appropriate. Oh uh, yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah, I like Donald. Yeah, he's free yeah. now. He's not. His show's done, so you know he's got time. Hey, come on. <laughs> you know, I've always found that. Yeah, and I've always found the couples I've met through work who says who can see each other's professional foundation, um, 
I've always found that my strongest friendships are relationships that have come out of work because I'm like, oh, I like the way you actually like handle your business. They really mm-hmm. seem to last more than friends who then decide to work together. That doesn't always always seem to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, we met at um, Charleston uh, Wine and Food Festival. We were both uh, doing right. a dinner uh, with BJ Dennis. Um, he invited Shout us, up. kind mm-hmm. of. Yeah. Uh, the, the unofficial godfather of all of our kids. Um, so uh, he put us on, on, a, on an event together and we had known each other because of social media. And sure. People kept saying, you know, you have to meet Sybil, you have to meet Omar. And we kind of experienced that, I guess, the week leading up to the festival. And then um, we met for a bar. We, we had drinks. We connected. We went to go play. We went to karaoke that same mm-hmm. night. Um um it was really fun and exciting and then we worked the event together we were prepping all day and it kind of just blossomed like it, it was a full moon and everything seemed right and we mm. left the festival kind of in love and uh ready to like take on the world together and then the world shut down because covid happened mm-hmm. and so, mm-hmm. uh, 2020 and so everything else blossomed through the intensity of covid and so it was a lot of zooms and a lot of like facetime and a lot of text yeah. messages emails and stuff like that and um that memes hmm? memes. Memes. memes a lot of memes a lot of memes, memes. <laughs> a lot of memes. yeah we would we would talk in meme that would that would be one of our, the our of the 21st century yeah yeah it's the way crazy. to court these days the way to flirt <laughs> yeah. a good meme game gotta have it <laughs> yeah, but also so charleston we- is such a beautiful city to fall in love in it's so romantic yeah, yeah. Was, I mean, like part part of it was you know, obviously my family is from there, and so in mm-hmm. our downtime, Sybil and I, because um, I've been there a few times, and, yeah. and uh, I can't remember. I think it was your first time in Charleston, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've been there a few times, and I had relationships and connections, but also had this like tangible relationship to it, where my family left homes there. Um, mm. you know, I learned about the plantation where my ancestors were enslaved, just outside of Charleston, and so we went to go visit. A church, you know, a couple of mm. churches that my family attended. We went to go visit the, the houses that my family left behind. And we had like this intimate moment of like this connection and relationship. And we ate around while we did it. And then um, I think that same night, no, the next morning, um, Sybil flew back to New York and left me in Charleston. And that's where the rom com part comes in because I'm bad <laughs> open around Charleston for a day. And I could have been doing anything else. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I see all the scenes of the movie, I see the karaoke one. You know, I see the the sad music, the the wistful looking out into the, you know, maybe yeah. doing like a dolphin boat ride in the estuary oh, yeah. by yourself. You yeah. know, yeah. Oh yeah, I see yeah. it all. I see a movie <laughs> there. And we had like we when we karaoke, we were with two chef friends, um, Kurt Evans and Kia Damon. Um, mm. So like you get the the comedic approach of just like the of course, funny, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, we'll we'll talk offline. We'll 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 put something together. We'll get a treatment. It's it's you know, um, you know the other thing I read about both of you, which I really love, and and look, it's one thing to connect over food and to cooking and having, um, that's a bit of history. But you also both um, have really strong creative backgrounds when it comes to the arts, with poetry, um, and art itself, and things like that. How? Did you two connect over that? And then how has that love, that creative passion, fueled your honeysuckle projects? <laughs> okay. I want to tell you something embarrassing. Um, one of the first things that we did was we wrote a poem together. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, that really happened. You, just Rom-com. give me a line. Just, just give me like two lines. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. I don't remember the most mm-hmm. time. <laughs> It was yeah. after karaoke. We wrote, we wrote yeah. a poem. Oh, we, yeah. like, we were like, yeah, we wrote a poem. yeah. And that was oh my like, God. yeah, no, like this is not a game. It's really a movie. <laughs> Paramount Pictures, please come through. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, you know, th- there's that. But you know, Sybil has um, her degree in African American Studies from the mm-hmm. University of Maryland. Um, I have been an artist my entire life, writing and doing visual art and. Um, you know, particularly painting and, and currently learning ceramics and stuff like that. And, um, you know, Honeysuckle as a pop-up was the integration of art and food um, as it lasted through New York. And um, Sybil has written a children's book called Elsie uh, hmm. while, while she was doing her pop-up, Kiona, in New York City. So, you know, we just, through conversation, realized that there were several different connections there and um, a passion, you know, more importantly than the connection, just a passion for um, 
art and food and writing, but in particular to Black cultural aesthetics and, and rediscovery and reclamation of our of our heritages and, I, and identities. And I think that was kind of like the, the foundation of, of all that. Now, not to jump too far ahead in careers, but um, Sybil, I know that you were doing uh, pop-ups inspired by Haitian food and Caribbean food. And, and Omar, you'd cooked in a lot of venerated Philadelphia and New York restaurants. Um, and jumping ahead a little bit to the launch of Honeysuckle, which was uh, the first time that I had heard about you, Omar, as a chef and the food that you were cooking in. What was the initiation of it? Why did you want to get out of other people's restaurants? And was that the first foray into your own type of project? And how do you feel with it if it was your first that it just seemed to hit immediately and you've been able to continue it on? Yeah. So, you know, after working 18 hours, feeling exhausted in 2017, I was I was working at a place called Once Upon a Tart in Soho, which was a, a brunch and bakery restaurant that operated um, from very early in the morning to very late. And, you know, I enjoyed working there, but I was also really trying to consider what my past could look like of ownership because I've always wanted to own my own place. Um, and I'm not sure if we can recall, but like around 2016, 2017 is when um, diversity in food and diversity in restaurants were, was like kind of like being ushered in. And it's an mm-hmm. initial thing. That's when Eduardo Jordan um, got three, not bells, three, uh, three stars from the New York Times and mm-hmm. bells mm-hmm. and, um, I think he won two James Beard Awards that year and all this, all these different things were happening. So um, I wanted to step away and really learn and dig in about myself and truly understand as an artist and as a creative person in food what that could look like. And that ultimately ended up becoming Honeysuckle Pop-Up after mm. a um, trip traveling down south and learning about my family's history, learning about um, black food ways, but really mostly kind of like gaining a thorough and holistic understanding of how Black culture, Black cultural aesthetics kind of show up in food and in like how, how it can show up in a menu or in a dining experience and what that looks like as comparable to other experiences in the restaurant space. So that was really the, 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 the foundation of everything. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's people forget about that time, about how things were starting to shift. And I think and we're going to talk to you about this after the break, but the pandemic really broke everything open and really exposed a lot of the issues that were going on. Um, We're going to take a quick musical break, and then when we come back, uh, we're going to talk more about Honeysuckle projects, provisions, and uh, what you are doing in the community you're growing in Philadelphia. We have a song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. Anybody's permission, it's always a right on Saturday night. He's in love with a girl whose reputation is showing up alone without a boyfriend. And every time they miss their connection, cause he don't know she's ready to go. No, no, is it ever really the right time to fall in love? And so she Fall in love. 
And he's lighting up the sky like a firefly, a firefly. Will it ever really be? Will it ever really be? Will it ever really be? Will it ever really be the right time to fall in love? Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We're here with Sybil and Omar of Honeysuckle Provisions and Honeysuckle Projects. And Omar, you were talking about 2016, 2017, about opening uh, and starting your own pop-up and getting a good amount of traction and everything's going well and the pandemic hits. And that was a real, real death blow, I would say, for a lot of pop-ups or restaurants and things like that. But it also took you out of New York full time and brought you back to Philadelphia. So that's not not the worst thing in the world. Um, but coming back to Philly and not being able to do your pop ups, um, how did you pivot? And what did you see really come to light for what I think a lot of us in the industry knew as a broken food system, but really got highlighted during the start of the pandemic? I mean, everything kind of expo- got exposed. You know, the cost of food got exposed. Um, broken food systems, broken governmental systems, all kinds of things got exposed. But, um, you know, in terms of what got exposed on a personal level for me was that, you know, um, it doesn't matter how many magazine articles you're in. It doesn't matter Mm. how much press you get. um, It doesn't mean you got money. So (laughs) as soon as everything (laughs) shut down, so did I. And I needed to um, reorganize myself. and, And I think this is where, Honeysuckle provisions really kind of like started to take shape. It's like, mm-hmm. what is the pop up really about? Is it really about being on the top floor, a penthouse on Wall Street, and serving food that costs one hundred and fifty dollars to two hundred dollars a guest? Sure, it could be about that a little bit, but really, it's about culture and heritage, and you know, the, the core of that in the black community. A lot of that, like the dining experiences that I had, the, lu- the luxurious dining experiences that I had in my own community. A lot of it happened in a takeout box. And so Honeysuckle became a takeout format um, that was operating, thankfully, to um, my friends at South Philly Barbacoa, um, Ben Miller and, and Christina Martinez. But, um, Shout out. Legendary Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, but all, you know, during that time, Sybil and I, we, we just met in March. The pivot happened in March. And so as I'm doing this takeout concept, Sybil and I are discussing, like, what could this really become? You know, um, what is the food? What is the concept? Who's it for? Uh, how are we going to do it? And, and we began to have conversations around provisions and the need for groceries and um, the need for uh, accessibility um, without compromising talent and skill, you know? And that was really the, the, the biggest pivot. You know, I feel like the pandemic also allowed people to open up non traditional restaurants, maybe not the right word, but food businesses where before it was like, oh, so you're not going to be open for lunch and dinner and breakfast and, oh, you're not going to be doing this and, oh, you're not going to be doing that. Well, then you're not really a restaurant. And I feel that people just went, hey, if you can sell good food and support the community and you can survive week to week, that's that's all that really matters. And it shifted a few things out of that. How did that mentality help shape what you wanted to do as a business and where you wanted to support other people in the food community and where you wanted to shine a spotlight. Yeah. So the, the pivot to kind of where we are now um, was, was a pretty natural one. Um, When, when the shutdown happened, a lot of the businesses that were still standing were the small mom and pop um, shops that were operating and doing takeout and and just kind of existing lo-fi um, and, uh, that really stuck, stood out to us. And as Omar said, I mean, he was back in West Philly and we were talking about 
the concept of provisioning and what that means for the community and, and, and how we can kind of show up in that way. And we noticed that West Philly was pretty much devoid of like a good grocery store, right? Mm. Um, there Mariposa exists and it's a co-op that's actually on Baltimore Ave. Um, that's not too far from us, but where um, Omar's mom was living in the Mantua community um, or the Mantua area of West Philly, we, we weren't really, the, the poppy shops might've had a few bell peppers or something in, sure, inside, sure. you know, they weren't offering fresh groceries, fresh produce. And Philadelphia is such an interesting um, place geographically because Lancaster County is so close, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. County is so close, South Jersey is so close. All this farmland is is so close. And yet there's this neighborhood of people who, who want fresh vegetables, who want access to these things. And they were kind of just lacking in that. Um, and so we saw the opportunity to really um, dig our heels into this community and, and just kind of bring everything that people deserved right to their front door. Um, And so the concept of grocery boxes and the concept of, well, how do we kind of give people food that's culturally relative to them, that that leans on the healthier side, although we're not afraid to use things like butter, um, but it kind of Mm -hmm. leans towards just changing their relationships to food in general. Um, And and it didn't have to be on a shiny plate. It didn't have to be on on bone china. It could exist in a takeout container. Um, Mm. And so we kind of ran with it and, and it's been working out really well for us and, and people respect it. I mean, um, oftentimes for our family, we don't eat on full bone China, right? A lot of we're mm-hmm. on the go and a lot of our meals are takeout meals or they're kind of like quick meals in the side of the road, um, all in between meetings or, or shoots or what, or what have you. And so, um, we wanted to create that kind of environment and establishment in the community for, for others around us and our neighbors and, and it, and it works and it makes sense. And being intentional about our sourcing and being able mm-hmm. to create relationships with black farmers in South Jersey, Krista Barfield and Farmer John, who um, does urban agriculture in Philadelphia also, like being able to make these connections and, and establish these relationships um, really just help strengthen what we're trying to do. And, and people appreciate it. Um, if we care about what they put in their bodies, how can they not care about what they put in their bodies? Mm, I love that. You know, the other thing I was surprised to find out is that you also have a farm and, um, you know, I grew up, like I said, Balakin Wood, and I remember going um, out to Bucks County or out to Jersey to pick blueberries and strawberries and things like that and make jam with my mom. And and it's very rural and things like that. But to know that you have a shop in, in West Philadelphia, but then you also own a farm in Montgomery County, I believe, correct? Um, we're, we're partnering with um, uh, a friend of ours who owns a, a place called Plowshare Farms. And shout out to mm. Plowshare, Teddy shout and Dave, family to us. Um, and our farmer, Dave Thompson, um, <laughs> who's, been doing, who's been doing the hard work. But um, yeah, it's in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Oh, Bucks County. That's great. I mean, what was the importance, if you have access and relationships to someone like, you know, Joel Barty and other farmers and things like that, you know, it's, you got a store to run. You got two kids. Why have your own farm? Like, why have a place where you're growing food for yourself? What's the story there beyond just saying we're going to sell what we grow in our shop? Um, well, there's several answers to that question, you know, um, and I feel like the, the answer to that question keeps changing, too, as the, the world's economy keeps changing and, mm. and it's happening. But I think um, originally, you know, both Sybil and I, Um, are kind of like a generation away or several generations away from the origins of our family story, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Haiti's uh, (laughs) Sybil's family is from Haiti. um, And although they're from Port-au-Prince, the stories that I hear from her mother and father is that that relationship, that connection to um, not just land, but also sea is also just like far more prevalent in their daily lives because of the kind of like community and society that exists within um, that nation. And then with my family being um, four generations removed from um, the South, from Charleston, and then even furthermore, I would say five to six generations removed from actual farming, um, you know, close to the end of slavery, my family moved to the city of Charleston. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of, not a bit of, but like a lot of reclamation in just us farming and um, redeveloping and reestablishing that relationship to the earth, to the soil, to the dirt. Mm -hmm. Um, that, That kind of like, really um, strikes a, a personal nerve for us, especially as like, you know, black people in this country feeling unfounded, you know, 
you know, oftentimes you see what's going on in, in the news now. There's mm -hmm. just so much disruption in our existence here. And to be able to like stake claim in the earth here in this country is just very special to us. Um, and then beyond that, there's, you know, um, kind of like this ephemeral way of like joining hands in the plight of the black farmer. You know, we're farmers mm. too. We're growing our own food. We understand what it takes to, 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 to provide sustenance for ourselves, not just for ourselves, but for our community. In the same way that someone like Joe, Joe Barty is doing, and in the same way that Crystal Barfield is doing, you know, mm -hmm. um, those, that connection, that relationship is very important. And then, you know, I think finally there's supply chain, right? Yeah. If you yep. control, you know, what you're growing and how much you can grow, you, you can control your costs. And at the end of the day, that affects your bottom line, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> and I see a lot of the stuff that you grow that makes it in not just the CSA boxes, but winds up on the menu and has a real direct influence to like what people are eating and feeding the community. And I think the thing that I really love about what you've built beyond just the pop-up, which is great and a great way to get started, but you've built this physical clubhouse this headquarters this this meeting of the minds this place where people can come and it's a big stake in the ground it's a big investment in saying that like we are going to have the doors open you will get fed we will feed you we will support your business because it's not a solo adventure the fact that you're shining a spotlight on um black farmers black purveyors you're looking at different ingredients different ways to create a new type of ecosystem is really important how has it been and how has it felt to be, I don't know, the mom and the dad of this clubhouse, of this location, of of now that you have your your own, you know, your kids and your family and you have your extended family, but it's this it's this you're welcoming people into your home on a daily basis. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it real. Keep it real. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that means you're doing the good work. That means you're doing good work. Because if you weren't tired, you'd be like, oh, all right, I guess. Yeah. You know. This is this is not a walk in the park. And I, you know, and I, we were not naive to start this venture and think that it was no, 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 no. smooth no. sailing. But what we didn't anticipate was just how much of um of, of a nurturing um, environment we had to create. Mm. Um, and we wanted that culture for our, our employees and our team. And we knew we didn't want a toxic environment. We knew what we didn't want um, right. to show up in our space, kind of like how it's, it's existed in other restaurants we've worked at. So that was like, we knew what was going to happen with that. What we didn't expect was to be really, like you said, like the parents of this, uh, of our... <laughs> front of the house right and it's like yeah. and then that, that is just um that's been really cool because uh we meet different people um i believe omar you you might have one time met like a distant cousin um but right it's just it's so bonkers because you meet people that you're connected to yeah. and family with um and that's like that that's what makes it very special um and we always talk about how we're earth building a world building with honeysuckle and this is just the beginning um and we have mm. plans branch out and expand um, and essentially help kind of not only reframe the food ecosystem, but also reframe just humanity and how, how people interact with each other mm. and, and just being kind to each other, right. And to being nice and to just seeing each other yep. as we are. And then, um, and that requires a lot of work and a lot of energy. And so sometimes, you know, for us at the end of the day, it's really tough. Um, and the sacrifices we've had to made, make to ex in order to exist for others in this way. Um, but there is something that is very fulfilling in knowing that if something happens to us and Honeysuckle years down the line is still around, um, that, that it can exist for our children and it can exist for our, the concept of the philosophy can exist for our children's children. And, mm. and that's especially important because that's the mark that we've been able to make. And um, that's what we do it for. We don't really do it. Honeysuckle is not for us. We say it all the time. It's not for us. It's barely for our generation. It's, it's, uh, a philosophy that we hope can kind of stick into the ground now and spread and expand upon for our children to enjoy and to really reap the benefits of this new ecosystem and this new way of life and this new way of interacting with each other. Mm, I love that. Now all you need is Donald Glover to come in for a sandwich <laughs> to have that meta moment full circle, right? Yes. 100%. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I can't thank you enough. I'm looking forward to swinging in when I'm back home in Philly. If people want to follow along, see how to order online, 
I mean, I saw that uh, incredible um, sweatshirt that you have and all the earthware that you're selling. Where can people go? How can they get uh, a taste of Honeysuckle? Well, you can come visit us in West Philly at 310 South 48th Street. Um, and what's that? Our website, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. www.honeysuckleprovisions.com or www.honeysucklephl.com. Mm. Uh, both both are, are a great way, all for different things, but a great way. And then we have Instagram. You want to tell them about Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Instagram is honeysuckle. It's at honeysuckle underscore provisions. Um, And that's for the storefront and all things food related and uh, at honeysuckle underscore projects is more for the overarching brand and art that um, we create. Yeah. That beef and broccoli sweatshirts. Very nice. Yeah. 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 It's great. Um, Well, thank you so much. So great. Shout out to Bailey for connecting us as well. And uh, we have a song from the archives, and then a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, weighing a combined total of 666 pounds, I give you Hungry As You! This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com.
Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. Uh, in the studio with us today, we have Miwi La Lupa coming at you live. Miwi, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I, I I didn't know your name when I reached out, but then when I saw you, I knew your face because I've seen you in so many backing bands. Um, how did that career kind of begin as being like a go-to guy for like some of like the biggest names? I mean, you've done stuff with like... David Byrne, St. Vincent, LP, uh, Frante, Fela, like, honestly, like, the who's who list of, like, tor- when they get ensembles. How did that come about? Um, just kind of hustling around the city with a with a horn or a bass guitar or just having, and also having several friends, um, I guess, involved with some of the different bands, like the Dap Kings and... Uh, We're former guests on the show. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I, <laughs> tell me, tell me I, where where did it be? Like, where did it begin? Because I feel there's roots of being like you know a lot of the people who come on the show are like bands and they just bands the fourth right. You are your own songwriter, but there's also like this other career that we don't normally get to talk to of like the kind of like ensemble musician. So like, where does that start? That starts by I guess playing in some bands at, like. A band like Biondo, a good friend of mine, Eric Biondo, mm-hmm. he played for many years and and just started playing again in Antibalis. So a lot of the Antibalis, you know, I had befriended Antibalis maybe 10 years ago and started playing a little bit with them. And, uh, you know, I guess it just takes one friend to, to recommend you for another gig when someone needs a, a horn player or a, or a, a bass player or a singer um, and then you know every gig you go on, you meet someone new, and they're like, "Oh, you played really well, and you like showed up on time, and you were prepared." So next time you knew I need the songs, you knew the songs. So next time I need something like that, then you know I'm, I might call you. So that turns into the occasional recording session for uh, you know for for David Byrne, that David Byrne and Saint Vincent record, and which is one of my all time favorites. Yeah, and I the, the tour was amazing too. I didn't get to. I had some friends on that played the tour, but yeah. you know they never sent me my copy of that record. So. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> apologies, apologies. But it was it was fun to record. That I just did one song. They had a, a lot of different uh, uh, brass band kind of mm-hmm. brass groups going, and I played on the track with. It was like a mixture of the Dap Kings horns and Antibalas horns and me. So, I mean, you're in here today with a guitar, um, but is there a particular instrument that? Um, well, list some of the instruments that you that you play. Well, um, well mostly guitar, uh, bass, trumpet. I I haven't been playing so much in the last few years, but bass, trumpet, and trombone, so kind of low brass. Uh, bass guitar, which is maybe my favorite instrument mm. to play, and uh, occasionally keyboards. You know, well, I played on the the Fela Broadway show keyboards because AJ wrote that into his part. So trombone and keyboards, I had to play. And then I and then I played when we went to Australia. Maybe it was earlier this year. I played bass in that too. So is there um, an instrument like everyone says like it's always hard to find like a good bassist and good drummer in a band? Mm. Is there a particular instrument that you feel like is your kind of like secret weapon because it's hard to find like that particular? Weapon uh, that uh, instrument for ensembles. It depends on who you talk to. Yeah. What, what is my secret weapon? Some, I mean, some people only know me as a, a horn player, mm. or and some people only know me as a, a singer and songwriter. You right. know, so I think the secret weapon might be. I don't know. Maybe maybe the electric bass because I'm not that technically skilled at it. So I. I a lot of, I guess, a lot of like rock bands and singer songwriter people want a bass player who doesn't want a rhythm section that doesn't really play too busy. They just want to have a nice groove, and that's all I can do. So, uh, <laughs> you're like, I got, I got one thing. I do it real you know, well. You know, I, can, I hope you like this. Yeah. Um, well, why, why don't we hear a song? Okay. What are you gonna play for us? This, I think, I'll start with um, with a song. I have a record coming out in March, and this particular song. Is not is not on the record, okay. And it's it's what it might you might hear it later because we recorded it for the record, but it's one of, maybe one of the B sides. Okay. I, yeah. 
Oh, it's called Five Months In. Okay. It has to do with moving to a big city and then leaving the big city for whatever reason. Okay. Um, live on Snacky Tunes. Some folks move to the city for anonymity. And other folks to spread their wings to see and to be seen. Money gets tight, the city lights don't shine and lose their all. When your luck returns, the hole that burns don't seem so bad at all, bad at all. Just a couple of drinks, you start to think of your old man sitting at home. So you call him up, but no answer, and you hope he's not alone. Broke his heart when you started off for a love and a lifelong dream. But five months in this big old city, turns cold and hard and me. It turns cold and hard and me. No small amount in your bank account, you work for months on end. Come April 1st, you pack your truck and head north with your best friend. Time you hit Virginia, making plans for Friday night. Maryland seems welcoming. You stop for a roadside bite by a light. You traded in your country views for the urban gray and black. Across the breeze called Washington, no plans on looking back. The first time there in Union Square. You found your scene Five months in this big old city It's cold and hard and me It turns cold and hard to me Country hues for the urban gray and black. Across the bridge called Washington, no plans on looking back. The first time there in Union Square, you think you found your scene. Five months in this big old city, it's cold and hard and me. It turns cold and hard and me. Change your name to some alias and hope we'd all comply. You grab your keys, rushed off to work before your painting dried. Your writing only dwindled and your cello stayed in the dark. You advertised with all your pride, first night tending bar, tending bar. Now she's sleeping straight till Tuesday, still wearing Sunday's best. She's blowing off commitments, friends are worried half to death. Come home, little Susie, it's your father's dying plea. The farm is yours in that big old city, turn cold, hard, and me. It turn cold and hard and me. Turn cold and hard and mean. I turn cold and hard and mean. So, touring with all those ensembles, how do you feel that's influenced your own songwriting? Or has it? I'm not sure it has. Okay. Um, Is it more like a more like a church and state type of separation, like? This is the music you get hired to play, and then this is the music that you write. No, uh, I I shouldn't say. It. I, I'm not. I guess I should say I'm not sure in which ways it has. Okay. Influence. Because if you're touring with the, if you're playing Fela's music, you're listening to his songs and his messages and playing them on different instruments or whatever. Uh, but as a singer, you're, you know, kind of getting in tune to what lyrically he's talking about, and so. Some of the songs on my next record are, you know, 
kind of feel emboldened, for example, from Fela to speak about more political things or, you know, social commentary. Um, so that's one way that you can be. Oh, interesting. So like the lyrics and the messages of the music, maybe less music, but like what they're saying has kind of expanded you. Sure. Sure. And what was it about, uh, Fela's music or what was it words that like gave you the confidence to speak up or speak out that you might not have otherwise had before? Well, part of this, his story, I guess, <laughs> that he kept going, he, that even after getting his butt kicked so many times by like, the, <laughs> the police and the government, he just, you couldn't, he, you know, he couldn't stop singing about what he saw was was wrong, you know, for his, you know, for everybody, you know, not just the people in his own country, but like, all of Africa and the, and the world, you know, kind of capitalism etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, what of what of those um maybe not those particular um messages but what messages have you seen in your own life that that is now like kind of come into your your new work um i i i don't know maybe kind of speaking out against uh you know capitalism and what's I mean, you see it right here in New York City, you know, the more, you know, the more money you have, the, <laughs> I guess now the, the closer you can live to Manhattan, right? besides like, you know, getting pushed out to East New York and, and beyond, you know, I think I heard they were building like a new like little colony out in the ocean somewhere so people <laughs> can have an a affordable place to live. Is that true? <laughs> they're, they're like building like another like garbage island so that oh i have no, no idea. I'm, yeah, that's a joke <laughs> i was like oh you kept saying i was like yeah that means it sounds about right yeah mm. and then like yeah but it's like garbage island's like super nice though like yeah, yeah. bad name but like really it's super nice oh uh, yeah it's like iceland you know yeah uh, iceland and garbage island um why don't we hear another song sure uh what's this one called this one um oh, okay so this one is uh, this is called the bright side and this one i'm actually in town to finish a new record and um kind of a mixtape style we'll put out on our own hopefully and then as soon as it's done kind of thing and this is called the bright side speaking about uh you know people getting in trouble for um having little bits of uh marijuana okay on them which i think is silly If you're facing the judge with a fistful of drugs All accomplices fled from your sight The responsible one feels the wrath Takes the brunt of it all With a false sense of pride The papers all follow you from town to town your exes all forward the mail For 36 moons, little food on her plate She's an outlaw in the salty state If you're still up at dawn Feeling trashed like a pawn in the game All the animals play Light a candle to pray, light the bowl and relate to the wild ones, the witches and slaves. She fought for a freedom that doesn't exist. What's wrong with these people? She cried just four years ago when her case is dismissed. We'll drive round the border or fly The shackles will fall to the ground Released from the spell for a while Maid. 
don't punish I made up mistake Only two things to choose Either jail time or blues The latter choice must make you stronger Be it one state or more If you don't know the laws Sentence could stretch on forever The bright side of torture Is stories for days The skeletons out of the closet The music is soothing Inspiring to boot The slow-moving sweet dissonance The shadows will fall to the ground Released from the spell for a while A record was clean by the maid Don't punish a made up mistake. So you said you're in town to finish uh, a new, finish the record. Um, how's the process been going? Uh, you're working with Connor Oberst, right? On it? We finished that record this summer. Okay. Um, Connor and Mike Mogus produced that, and we recorded out in Omaha. Okay, at their awesome studio. How long do you get to spend time in Omaha for? For th- making that record, yeah. Um, we finished it in two weeks. Okay. So the first week, my band from here was out there, and the second week was mixing. So it was a lot of kind of hands on deck to finish it that quickly. Yeah, it's really fast. But you know, you know, Mogus is a very busy man, and yes. so <laughs> he had the two week window, yeah. and, and you know, we kind of, we came in really prepared. It's awesome. The band did, and then you know, and everyone worked their butts off to to make it happen. Uh, so and so, this record we're finishing with a different producer. Is, okay. Uh, we did the basics here in New York, and then I moved to Omaha in okay. early September. Oh, and. We, then I did some overdubs at, at the same studio, and I'm coming back to mix and master those sessions. So permanent residence in Omaha or temporary residence? I, I indefinite residence. Really? Yeah. What is it about Omaha that uh, has taken you out of New York City? Well, um, chance would have it that Connor, uh, one of our good friends, was living at with Connor at his house, and he moved out. Mm. with his girlfriend and bought another house so Connor and his wife invited me to live with them in their wonderful house with their sweet dogs and you know so yeah getting to you know having been playing with him for quite some time and working at the studio and it being affordable to live there yeah and getting to make more music and do things like make more records and Mm. participate in other records and um is the scene still i mean you know from my college radio days omaha was like this mecca of scene does that type of support and community still exist there or is it is it different or well, how would you describe it i i would uh, yeah i've been working at uh hearing a lot of local music and touring bands at this club that a lot of the guys in the band cursive own now called olivers love cursive yeah what am i like all-time favorites yeah, so, uh, yeah, so that, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, the, I mean, so when you have a band that owns a bar, they have all, you know, yeah. they're so supportive. They yeah. have band, you know, touring bands and How's a lot sound of local system? bands. It sounds amazing in yeah. there. Oh, man. That, like, yeah. yeah. You should, I mean, next time you're in Omaha, no. come to Oliver's. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's funny where, like, you see the difference between, like, venues that, like, have, like, like it's fine. Yeah. Versus like the musician led one, and they just have like all these crazy like amps and everything, and every the, 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 the sounds. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the the PA there sounds great. They don't have too much in the way of backline, so they a lot yeah. of bands bring their own backline. Yeah. But so yeah, that between Olivers being a place where musicians can come and play, bands can come and play, and Page Turners, which Oberst and our buddy Phil own, mm. having less rock and roll, but having I just played there the other night. Mm-hmm. Um, so the scene is, I think, still it's kind of early for me to tell I, you know i wasn't there yeah you know when you say it was like yeah. i think it might have been their heyday but yeah. i think there's there's still incredible oh i don't think it's heyday i think it's like it was such it was more like a hey if you want to be a musician and be surrounded by musicians this place is cheap it's got good support and everything yeah um you know and different cities over like the the years montreal was like a hotbed for a long time you know there's just like so i'm kind of curious you know if that still is the uh the case and it's still supportive community yeah i think so yeah. i've i've found a lot of support out there so far denton was another one too yeah um, where mid lake came from they're just like you know these these towns that are just like not necessarily major cities but where it is you can make a living and live. right right yeah it's it's great and i just imagine it's it's kind of close to a lot of other you know maybe slightly bigger cities or st louis your minneapolis chicago is not too far you can get to the east coast and the west coast within like two hours flying so awesome. it's kind of it's it makes a lot of sense you know for, yeah artists who want to like myself who want to so besides yeah. finishing the record um what's on the horizon uh tour yeah uh playing some shows in town here i guess i don't know when this airs but i'm playing some sh- you're playing in new york playing in new york yeah uh this week a couple of shows and then i'm going to europe in mid-january supporting a band from manchester and uh and then for two weeks and then another two weeks on my own and playing a couple of shows with The Good Life it's like my new favorite band and it's good amazing. friends of mine and uh, so there's, I'll be in Europe for a month mid-January to mid-February it's awesome yeah I'm ner- I'm going up by myself so uh, a little nervous but I'm very excited what an adventure though I know I haven't I haven't even bought my plane ticket back oh. I don't oh. know so I need to <laughs> <laughs> maybe get a subletter in Omaha oh yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and then, and then the record that I did with with Connor and Mike Mogus comes out on Team Love Records in late March. So, you know, hopefully doing some some tours around that. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, we're gonna make sure we have time for one more song. Okay. Um, but where can people find you? Get your music. Uh, make sure they get the new record. Learn all about you. Okay. Probably hit you up for an ensemble. Uh, How are you for some groovy bass playing? Yeah. Um, just miwilalupa.com. dot com. Oh, uh, easy. Yeah, it's pretty. That wasn't taken? No, it wasn't taken. <laughs> okay. No. No. Uh, cool. So what are you well, uh, what are you gonna take us out with? Um, this is a song that's pr- probably gonna it definitely gonna be on the the kind of mixtape called Beginner's Guide, and this is the title track to that one. Okay. Well thanks for uh tuning in. Uh appreciate it. I uh, hope all is well out there. We will be back next week with another episode of Snacky Tunes. Uh, take us out. All right. Can you hear the sound of the waves? I can hear it from here. I think I made it. Got another several weeks of this mayhem. It's a rat city. It's a luxury. Gonna call old Kelly and ask her for a thousand bucks She's a future woman On the twenty dollar bill Naked A breast exposed just a little bit Scared All the Midwest looks What will I be? Who will I be? Kiwi meat Will I stay on fleek or flee? Back to the city Got a couple of questions about the last ten odd years First one Was I there? Did we use the time we all had wisely? Did we squander it? Celebrating everything Posing Fearing loneliness growing bitter A working Or upgrade status someday Oh, what could it be? With neighborhood, a high rise with a view, or a cottage in the countryside. How to prepare for a major change? 
Start selling packing weeks in advance Would you cry beyond it last night Comforted by your courage Would you notify A black Irish goodbye We ain't playing Are we leaving Catch you on the flip side Da 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 Square up with my bankroll friends I get the feeling this is not unusual Waving goodbye to the ghetto birds Must be time for the show First to compliment the millennials It's your time to do the dance Your tongue not up And you say I do, I do Send a shout out All the freelance freaks doing Lord's work Making major moves To the garbage men The bar keeps the up all nighters, nine to fivers. How to prepare for a major change? Start selling packing weeks in advance. Would you cry on your last night? Comforted by your courage, would you notify a black Irish goodbye? We ain't playing. Are we leaving? Catch you on the flip side We talk about food We talk about music With musical dudes Finger on the pulse Snacky Tunes Snacky Tunes is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.